Good morning, big girls. Today, we're going to make sure that we don't leave the big girl position out of the ranking. So we're going to be showing some love to the quarterbacks and the tight ends. The last couple of weeks, we've gone into our top 25 running backs for the 2024 season, our top 25 wide receivers for the 2024 season. If you missed those, we will link them down below. Go watch before, go watch after. Don't matter. Just make sure it enters your vision. Today, we're going to run through the top 25 quarterbacks quickly, the top 25 tight ends quickly, uh, and then discuss more in depth the players that I am furthest from in terms of ECR. So expert consensus rankings, other people in the industry rank these guys on fantasy pros and the ones where I have the biggest difference, either higher or lower, we will touch on briefly because we got to get through two positions. So I don't want to yap for too long about any of these specific players. But if you have questions, comments, concerns, want to um, talk further about anybody, do that in the comment section. Go yap down there. While we're down there, down there, let's tuck our shirts in, of course. Was a giddy. All right, so we'll go through all of my QB rankings. And again, we'll just kind of stop at the ones where I feel like I have a relatively significant difference uh, relative to ECR. So I have Jalen Hurts as my one, Josh Allen as my two, whereas in ECR, they're actually flipped. I got Jalen Hurts as my one just because Josh Allen loses a lot of weapons, obviously, Diggs and Gabe Davis, loses a lot of targets. We don't really know how that offense is going to shape up. I think when uh, Joe Brady came in, took over, became very running back centric. Jalen Hurts, I like the addition of Kellen Moore. I think it's going to be a very fast paced offense. I think it's going to look a little bit different. Uh, they locked up Smith. They locked up A.J. Brown. They brought in Saquon. So the loss of Jason Kelsey is going to hurt a little bit. But this is also a dude who's scored double digit touchdowns in three straight seasons. So I don't really see any difference. And we haven't really seen a passing ceiling from him. Not that it's going to happen or that I feel confident that he's going to go statistically above where he's at currently or he's been the last couple of years. But if it does happen, he's going to be a monster. But I got Jalen Hurts at one, Josh Allen at two, Patrick Mahomes at three, Lamar Jackson at four, same as ECR. I have Anthony Richardson at five, ECR is him at six. I got Dak at six, which is two spots above ECR. CJ Stroud at seven, which is two spots below ECR. And I'll dive into Dak a little bit. I've talked about him um, quite a bit already because I've touched on a lot of the skill players out in Dallas so far. With Dak, uh, I mean, listen, like, the backfield is just set up for this to be such a pass-heavy offense. It's only Zeke and, and Rico Dowdle behind Dak, right? So that just tells me that their entire offense is pretty much going to flow through the passing game. And I thought, you know, when they lost Kellen Moore, it was going to be a hit to the offense, the pace, the number of plays that they would slow down, but that just wasn't the case at all. You know, they, sh they tried to shove it down Tony Pollard's gut last year, but after the bye, they went extremely pass heavy and it worked really really well for them they found a lot of success with the Dak CD Jake Ferguson kind of momentum in that offense they were like you know unstoppable and Dak last year led the NFL in passing touchdowns he was number three in passing yards I don't see much change there I think his statistics have such a high floor I would feel great with him as my QB one and you're talking about a guy CJ Stroud who's going clearly above him in ECR where I feel like Dak's floor of you know think about what he did last year with 4600 and over 30 touchdowns kind of thing like if cj stroud did that that would be considered a major major success of a campaign so i almost feel like what we're hoping to see out of stroud is probably what we should be expecting to see out of dak prescott so that's kind of where the swap comes for me uh when it comes to those two i have burrow at eight which is one spot lower than ecr i have kyler murray at nine jordan love at 10 which is the same Tua at 11, Jared Goff at 12, Jared Goff on two spots higher, Brock Purdy on two spots lower. I think all those guys are kind of in the same tier. They all performed similarly last year, Tua, Goff, Purdy. They all have extremely good weapons, which I think makes all of them really, really high floor players. They don't add a ton in the rushing department, so I think like their ceiling's a little bit capped, but I feel relatively good with them as someone that you can kind of put into your lineup and you know expect to get 18, 19, 20 points per game over the course of the season. My biggest, my biggest swap here is Stafford up at quarterback 14, which is five spots higher than ECR. ECR has my quarterback 19. Now, I think a lot of this will probably depend on Cooper Cup's health. But when you look at Stafford's campaign last year, overall, like the raw stats didn't end up getting there. Like it didn't, it wasn't like eye popping in terms of, you know, holy shit, Stafford really revitalized himself, thrown for 4,800 yards, whatever. But he threw for 3,965 yards. So right underneath 4,000, 
24 touchdowns, importantly, in 15 games, all right? If you take out the game where he got hurt in week eight and he played less than half the snaps, so you're talking about like the real sample size of the 14 games where he was the quarterback for the full game, we're looking at a 17-game pace last year of 46-18 in the passing yardage department, which would have been six yards behind Tua, who was the NFL league leader, and 28 passing touchdowns, right? And that was without a healthy Cooper Cup for a lot of the year. That was with Kyron Williams eating up goal line carries. He had the six most goal line carries in the entire NFL last year uh, as it relates to running back. So if he stays healthy, if they start to go a little bit more pass heavy in the red zone on the goal line, like Stafford could see a crazy bump in statistics. And I get it. Asking for a full 17 games out of Stafford at this point in his career definitely feels like a reach, but you still get those per game numbers, right? So quarterback 19, where he's getting drafted right now, or where ECR has him, just feels really low for someone that's in an explosive offense led by Sean McVay. Like their offense was seventh in yards per game last year, fifth in yards per play, uh, sixth in yards per attempt on a passing efficiency basis. Like everything was there for the infrastructure on a team that we didn't expect to really play well, but they got their one in Puka. They have Cooper Cup. Even Demarcus Robinson played really, really well for them down the stretch. Tutu Atwell had times where he was like pretty good for them. So their weapons group is a little bit deeper than I think most people realize. And I think it's going to be a huge benefit to Stafford, obviously. I got Caleb Williams at 15, which is two spots lower than ECR. I feel like uh, I feel like that I'm correct on this one. So you guys can go fucking take a walk. Kirk Cousins, I've got two spots higher than ECR at quarterback 16. More so, I'm not really in love with Cousins, but I just feel like the lack of options after him makes me throw him up here. I have a feeling by the time, uh, in, in like a month or so, I might I might throw T-Law over Cousins or up to like top 15-ish. I just don't feel very comfortable with him right now. Like his ceiling so far, he he's finished every season with between like 39 and 4,100 passing yards. I, I don't know how much has changed in this offense that's really going to like unlock more statistical upside for Trevor Lawrence outside of just being like he's going to develop more uh Brian Thomas sure like he could be you know an alpha there maybe I saw him as more of like an elite number two in an NFL team um but they lost their number one in Calvin Ridley so I, I don't know kind of all things equal out there a little bit for me I've got Herbert at 18 where that is three spots lower than consensus and I feel fucking great about my ranking on Herbert like he's not someone I feel anywhere near comfortable putting him in as my starting quarterback in a one quarterback league. I just think he's a low ceiling, like more often than not, I think he's going to give you 15 or 16, 17 fantasy points at the quarterback position. I mean, he's been like, look at the last two years. He's been a borderline top 15 fantasy quarterback on a points per game basis in, in each of the last two seasons. And that is despite running the third and second most plays per game, respectively, in those years. Now you lose. Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler, who have averaged over 315 targets per season over the last three seasons. And it's not like Gerald Everett's a, a big factor here, but they also lose him. So it's like you look at the loss of weapons. You look at the addition of Harbaugh and Greg Roman coming in. They chose to draft Joe Alt with the number five pick instead of taking a Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze. I just think this is going to be one of the slowest run heaviest teams in the NFL. His season-long line right now on underdog for passing yardage over the season is like 3,600, all right? And I get it. Like, some of y'all just want to bet on his talent purely, which I get. He has a strong arm, and he makes flashy plays and highlight plays throughout the year. But there's more that goes into talent. There's more that goes into being a great quarterback. There's more that goes into being a great fantasy quarterback, okay? So I need to see more from Herbert as a talent just to throw him above some of these other QBs. But statistically speaking, this is going to be a slow, run-heavy offense with very, very poor weapons. Cool. Lad McConkey is a fun route runner. Like, guys, let's just everybody simmer down. All right. After Herbert at 18, I've got Rodgers at 19. I've got Deshaun Watson at 20. I've got Baker Mayfield at 21. Not a lot of flip flopping going on here. I've got Jane Daniels down at 22, which is six spots lower than ECR. I didn't think I would really have to explain myself, but now that I've been on a few podcasts, now that I've looked at the ECR, I am really low on Jaden Daniels. So maybe I have to rethink this. And I get it. Like, it's not that hard to, uh, like, I was on JJ Zacharyson's podcast last week, and I actually uploaded the video to this channel. So maybe you guys have already seen that. But he asked me about Jaden Daniels, and I kind of gave him my reasoning for why I'm lower than consensus because he's going as quarterback 12. Like, ECR, that's just rankings for season long, has him at 16. If you go to draft on underdog, best ball, he is the quarterback 12 right now which I get it because you're looking for like ceiling spike weeks. You don't have to decide when to play the guy. So on those weeks where he rushes for 70 yards and a touchdown, you're getting those points in your lineup. So, of course, you should be valued a little bit higher. But like with Jaden Daniels, I, I don't think anyone can make a real argument 
for the situation, for the team, for anything outside of like rushing upside. And I get it. That's burned us before, though. With Jaden Daniels, I look at the situation. I have like Cliff Kingsbury is a fraud to the highest degree. I have no confidence that that offense is going to run smoothly with him dictating how the offense runs. I get it. He has NFL experience. He he was like was not that good of a coach at the college level. Like his teams were not winning at the college level, really. And then all of a sudden he got an NFL head coach job. Like it was one of the most insane jumps I'd ever seen for a coaching trajectory. But he did it. By the time his tenure was done in Arizona, the dude had absolutely like no sense of like how to actually utilize the players in his offense to have success. He came in and Kyler was great to begin with. But as soon as NFL teams figured him out and what his scheme was about by year two, year three, like that offense was miserable. OK, it was all just like, Kyler, go make a play. Kyler, do something fucking in insane. And it's not like teams don't have four years worth of film now on Cliff Kingsbury's offense. I have a terrible feeling about his tenure that's about to happen in Washington. And, it, it, you know, talking about Washington, just the situation outside of the coaching staff is like Terry McLaurin's the one real alpha behind him, though. Like, no one really is saying this or realizes it, I don't think. They have nothing at the weapons position. They lost Curtis Samuel, and they have Jahan Dotson as the two there, okay? Jahan Dotson is coming off of, like, one of the worst seasons from an NFL wide receiver in recent memory, especially relative to, like, where we had him coming into the year. If Jahan Dotson is who he played as last year, their number two receiver is awful. I'm not saying he is. I'm not saying, like... You know, he is who he was last year. Maybe he's more of a mixture of what he did his rookie year. Although when you look at his numbers, his rookie year, they really weren't that great. They were just stifened by a lot of touchdowns. His yardage was low. His receptions were low. His efficiency wasn't great. He just had like eight touchdowns, which is very like Anthony Miller-esque for all y'all Bears fans out there. And a lot of times when like a, a season is kind of buoyed by just like a high touchdown number, it gets shadowed away, right? It gets kind of like put on the back burner. We're like, we just remember like, oh, good fantasy season, had a lot of stats, got a lot of points for me, but didn't realize like it didn't come from being good. It just kind of like right place, right time, score touchdowns. All a long-winded way of saying like they don't have a tight end. They don't have a good offensive line. They have almost no depth at receiver behind Terry McLaurin, depending on how you feel about Jahan Dotson. But imagine this. Imagine Terry goes down. Their wide receiver group just became one of like the bottom three wide receiver depth charts in the entire NFL. And like, let's look at last year. Sam Howell got sacked a billion times, right? The only team, only only the Giants had more sacks allowed to their quarterbacks in Washington last year. Take a step back, look objectively. How many times have we seen a rookie quarterback go into a situation where he's going to feel a lot of pressure? There are going to be a lot of sacks coming his way with a poor weapons group. How often does that quarterback hit his ceiling, yet not even like ruin it, the trajectory of his career? I don't even want to go that far down. But that, that, that formula right there, bad offensive line, a lot of pressure, poor weapon groups, like that very rarely ends in a good situation for that quarterback. OK, so I'm just saying like way more things have to break lucky and break right. I think for Jaden Daniels to finish as a top 12, 13, 14 QB, than him just like struggling throughout, having a bunch of 185 yard, one touchdown, one interception, like take three, four sacks, maybe rush for 30 yards kind of games. And maybe that gets you to 16, 17, 18 points per game. And listen. If he plays a full 17, even like 15, he should get to 500. He is an elite rushing quarterback. Very fast, very explosive. A lot of times I think he does that too early, though. Like he doesn't really progress through his reads. And that could also end up, he could just take a ton of hits this year. Between the sacks and between the rushing, there's just a lot of red flags that I see. So Jane Daniels is a dude I think is okay to draft in one quarterback leagues because you're just looking for upside. And if it doesn't work out, you drop them, pick up someone on the waiver wire. In super flex leagues, you don't have the luxury of being able to grab guys from the waiver wire because quarterbacks are su super valuable. So I'm just pointing out the red flags. Y'all do what you want. Okay. Let's move on to the tight ends. And before we get into the tight ends, I I wanted to just uh, throw this on your guys' radar. I don't know how much crossover we have between the brands inside of BDGE. Right, we have the normal redraft fantasy football channel. We have the dynasty fantasy football channel. We actually just launched a BDG betting channel, which is me and all the guys in the office, really just talking football and just talking bets purely. Um, so if you didn't know about that and you are someone who gambles a lot, someone who likes you know playing on an underdog, the pickums and stuff like that, we have a channel on YouTube specifically focused on that stuff that we're going to be hitting a ton throughout the season and in the preseason stuff like that. So we will link that down below to go subscribe. And the last thing that we have is our trivia channel. So we do a ton of like fantasy football, just NFL in general style trivia games daily. It's coming out on YouTube. It's coming out on TikTok. I'm sure some of you guys have seen it. There's probably a lot of crossover. We are hosting a live trivia tournament in New York City pretty much a month from now. I'm not sure when this video is going up, but it's July 13th. So I think you guys will see this pretty much a month from now. 
It is at a bar a couple blocks away from the office. Uh, we basically rented it out. We got six teams that are playing against each other. BDG, we got Snapback, Nerd Sesh, if you guys are on TikTok. We got fa uh, Matt Barry's Fantasy Life. I'll link where you can get tickets down below. So if you've ever wanted to come just like hang out, meet the guys or whatever, this is kind of the perfect opportunity to do that. So you can come watch us, you know, compete in the trivia tournament for a couple hours. You can be at a bar, you can drink, you can eat, whatever. And afterwards, I got a rooftop. So we'll just be hanging out and kind of drinking the night away and, and just like meeting everybody that are our fans. So if you're into that kind of thing, if you've wanted to meet the guys, if you wanted to hang out, whatever, uh, just participate in the trivia tournament, et cetera. We got tickets on sale right now uh, on BDGE.com shop okay july 13th if you're in the city easy money if you are outside of the city maybe grab a couple of your homies some people from your fantasy league throw this throw the link to the tickets into the fantasy league group chat see if you can get a group of you know three four five six guys buy three tickets get the fourth free with promo code big girls b-i-g-g-i-r-l-s or youtube 10 all caps for 10 percent off your purchase bdge dot shop Let's talk about some uh, tight end shop action right now. Let's start off hot here. Let's start off motherfucking hot right now, okay? Sorry for the kids in the back. I apologize if you watch my videos. Like they did the 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 passion just comes out in form of cursing. I know it's immature, but whatever. Uh, Trey McBride, he's my number one. He, I know that's that feels insane to a lot of people. He is my tight end one this year for redraft. He is the tight end three in ECR. Uh, ECR has Sam Laporta as the one and Travis Kelsey as the two. I have McBride, then Laporta, then Kelsey. Now, Trey McBride. If y'all watched Kyler and Trey McBride operate together last year, this really shouldn't be that much of an argument. I know people are going to lose their shit over this. Guys, we're talking about like a one to two rankings change different year to year. These types of changes, like Trey McBride was like the tight end 20 last year going into the year. Same thing with Sam Laporta. Like, calling, like going crazy over a one different ranking change because it's not your opinion. Just shut, just shut, just shut, shh. Sh okay? Let me talk about Trey McBride. Trey McBride and Kyler made magic together last year. When we look at the splits, shout out to FTN. They have this splits tool that you guys can use absolutely free on their website. In the eight games with Kyler Murray, last year versus the eight games without him last year. Look at Trey McBride's numbers. 8.3 targets per game, 6.6 .6 receptions per game, 67.3 receiving yards, a touchdown every three games, full PPR, 14.8 points per game. Full PPR, 14.8 points per game in the eight games. This is not a three-week sample size, not a four or five-week sample size. This is a half a season sample size. That 14.8 PPR fantasy points per game would have been tied with Travis Kelsey for the tight end one in points per game. And I know a lot of y'all probably think Sam Laporta got the one, but in points per game, Travis Kelsey was actually the PPR tight end one in fantasy last year. McBride, in the games with Kyler Murray, who was not at full strength last year, was tied for the tight end one in PPR fantasy points per game. Okay. I absolutely love the chemistry they developed last year. Uh, Marvin Harrison's obviously a beast. I think that just contributes to the success of this offense, but I still think McBride is the clear goal line red zone option in the passing game. His hands are extremely strong. Uh, and I couldn't be more all in on, on Trey McBride this year. So he is my one. I don't give a fuck how you feel about it. All right. I also think the thing with the tight ends this year is the top four guys, I think you could almost push it out to like six with Kittle and Kincaid in that mix. I almost feel like they should just be consecutive picks in fantasy drafts. Like people are going crazy for Laporta. I think a lot of it is like the dynasty community kind of dripping over into redraft right now. But like Laporta is an early third round pick. And the rest of the tight ends, like you can get McBride at, at the end of the fourth round, four or five turn. You can get like Mark Andrews, end of fifth, sixth round pick. And I'm like, are you really that confident that Sam Laporta is going to outscore Mark Andrews to the point that you should be drafting him three rounds fucking earlier? That's crazy to me, all right? Especially with like the weapons group they have there in Detroit and any way that this target tree can kind of shift if Jameer Gibbs takes a step up from like 70 targets to 90 or if Jameson Williams is even like relatively good, he's going to see a, a high percentage of targets start to go his way too. So I, I think like the Laporta hype has gone great player and would love to just have him on my team if I could get him at a reasonable price, but his price is fucking insane relative to, again, McBride a, a round and a half later, Kincaid two rounds later, Mark Andrews two and a half rounds later, like insane to me. As we keep working down, I do have Mark Andrews as the four. I've Kincaid as the five. I've got Kittle as the six. I want to throw up, but I have Pitts as the seven and Evan Ingram as the eight. And that is uh, actually bar for bar, click for click, 
brick for brick the same as ECR and where the rankings are. I got Jake Ferguson as my tight end nine. I, I just think he's a super safe floor play. Njoku was kind of on fire last year, so I think he kind of just deserves to be a top 10 guy. I have him as number 10. ECR has Ferguson and Njoku flipped. I got Dallas Gar as the 11, and that is where ECR has him. However, I feel like he's kind of been the forgotten tight end this year. Like, you can get him really late in underdog drafts, and I'm kind of just a fan of buying the dip in the Philly offense in general. Like, I know they struggled over the second half of last year, but I go back to Kellen Moore, right? Kellen Moore was fantastic in Dallas. And the reason that we loved him in Dallas was because of the pace of plays, the number of plays that they ran. The offense was just very fast. And he moved over to L.A. And everyone was kind of like hyped about the move. And while the, the Chargers offense last year was a fucking mess, they still ran the seventh most plays per game while averaging the fourth lowest time of possession. So they ran a shitload of plays despite not having the ball much. They had the sixth highest pass rate overall. They ran no huddle on the fourth highest rate last year. So like despite the lack of production in that offense, Justin Herbert, the pace of play, what we saw from Kellen Moore in Dallas still moved over to L.A. And I am super confident that it will move over to Philly. So put Jalen Hurts in a very up-tempo offense. I think it could be really good for this passing offense. And I think Dallas Goddard is kind of going under the radar where he's a tight end 11. Uh, do I feel like he has a huge ceiling? Probably not. Maybe if some touchdowns break right for him, like he could finish at the tight end six or seven. It's not really that big of a difference there. So I'm in on Goddard this year. Dalton Schultz I've got as my 12, which is surprisingly two spots higher than ECR. When I look at Dalton Schultz, like I'm not in love with him as a player, I guess, but I think he's a good player. And they just gave him an extension. He's only 27 years old. He's locked into CJ Stroud. Obviously a ton of target competition going on there. But Schultz has been really consistent. He is one of four tight ends in the NFL to have at least 575 or more yards in all four of the previous four seasons. So you have Kelsey, Kittle, Hawkinson, and Schultz going over 575 receiving yards at the tight end position in each of the last four years. Only those four tight ends have done it. I think a reason Schultz has dropped is because Brock Bowers is the tight end 13 in my rankings, but the tight end 12 in ECR. Like, I just think I'm, I'm pretty out on Brock Bowers in redraft. It's a iffy QB situation out there in Las Vegas. I like Minshew to win the job, but if AOC wins the job, it's going to be problematic for that entire passing offense they have an elite target earner over there already in Devonte adams the team just drafted a tight end in the top 35 last year who probably won't be great but like it'll be annoying enough to where brock bowers like doesn't exceed 55 60 percent of the snaps until maybe like week 10 11 12 and we're just going to be complaining about it all year and you have a head coach that just wants to run the shit out of the ball in antonio pierce so like i i, I get it the name is fun we're coming off of dynasty season, dynasty rookie season, rookie, you know, just rookie hype in general. Brock Bowers does not need to be a top 10, top 12 drafted tight end right now in fantasy. As we keep moving down, uh, Cole Komet, I've got two spots higher. I just think the touchdown upside is relatively high in the Chicago offense. So again, maybe things break right for him. I've got Pat Fryermuth at tight end 15. I've got Hawkinson at tight end 16, which is three spots lower than ECR. Uh, this is a, an injury optimism ranking for the public right now. And I will tell you quickly why tight end 13, tight end 12 is very wrong for TJ Hawkinson. All right. He had a multi ligament knee tear in December. However, he did not have surgery until the very end of January, early February. So despite the injury happening in December, because it's multi-ligaments, you need to have multiple surgeries. And with multiple surgeries, you need to let the swelling come down. So it's like, okay, we want to get to the ACL, but we actually have to fix the MCL first. Let the swelling go down, fix the MCL. You need to recover from the MCL. Then a month later, whatever, then you can get into the ACL. So whenever the injury happened, because it's a multi-ligament tear, the real surgery where it's like, okay, now he's on the nine to 10 month timetable to return doesn't actually happen until a month or so later. So Based on that timetable, he won't be nine months removed from the ACL surgery until the end of October, early November. OK, that's awful for an injury timetable as it relates to an NFL tight end. So I think there's a very good chance above 50 percent that he actually just starts the year on the pup. You're missing four to six games, probably. Uh, I really don't think we're going to see Hawk running, you know, 70, 80 percent of the route snaps in this offense until like late late November, maybe even like late December. Uh, the injury pessimism, I think y'all need to drink a little bit more over here, right? Uh, and to be honest, I would move Hawk down like eight more spots in this ranking if I felt like there was anyone worthy of moving up. 
But after him, you have a lot of dudes that will more likely than not average like 20 receiving yards per game. I got Hunter Henry next. I think Henry's kind of like a sneaky, a sneaky goodbye in fantasy right now. Um, not over the moon, but I mean, he's always been a touchdown scorer throughout his career. I could see him being Drake Mays like number one target there. After Henry, I have Luke Musgrave. I really like Tucker Craft as a talent, so I don't think Musgrave's like starting job is assured for the entire season. Then I've got Noah Fant. Noah Fant is my 19 which is not very high, but it is eight spots higher than ECR, okay? The Seahawks have the sixth most tight end targets available going into 2024. Uh, they just gave him a two-year, $21 million extension. He was a first-round pick, very athletic, obviously. Kind of been a little bit of a cone since entering the NFL. Every once in a while, you get like a crazy breakaway play for Fant that you're like, oh, that's why, that's where that athleticism went. But he's not very, like, not a great, well-rounded tight end. W what I like about Fant, or I guess the situation more than even Fanta players, just like all of those random ass tight ends that have always been just such a problem in the Seattle group where it's like, okay, finally I like Fant, but then it's like, okay, this guy has a three for 52 in a touchdown game. It just ruins the entire tight end carousel there. Will Disley, gone. Kobe Parkinson, gone. Like all Jacob Powell, like all those names that we've heard over the years are all gone. It's Noah Fant at the top of the depth chart and like nobody behind him, okay? So if we're like putting all the tight end stats together, Fant maybe getting 75 to 80% of them, it's going to be a relatively good year. Okay. So I just think you're, I think you should be drafted above tight end 27, 28. Uh, I like Fant as like a back end tight end two here. I also don't hate just one more quick sleeper. Shout out to Jonu Smith for the good memories out there in Atlanta. I don't hate Jonu as a dart throw either. Like he's coming off of a good year in Atlanta. He's kind of like a perfect skill set match in Miami. And they still don't have any real target earners behind Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. So I think he could be like a cool skill set vibe match pick there in Miami. Okay. So those are my tight ends. Those are my quarterbacks. Those are both of those positions. My top 25 QBs, my top 25 tight ends, along with how they compare to ECR. And that's the video for today. Okay. So if you enjoyed Hit the button that looks like this. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. And again, if you want to come out to the trivia tournament, I would love that. I would love to meet you. If you did buy tickets or you plan on buying tickets, uh, drop a comment down below. I'd love to get a feel for like the people that are that are coming out in July. Uh, those tickets, again, are available on bdge.shop. You can use the promo code YouTube10 for 10% off your purchase. Or big girls, buy three, get one free. I'll see you all next week, tomorrow. I don't know.